So my name is Ryan Haar. I do work for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I'm a private lands wildlife biologist for them for North Central Iowa until my colleague re retired last Thursday. So I'm also of North Central and Northwest Iowa. And then I get to do special projects for the state. So whenever the state deals with Army Corps of Engineers or Fish and Wildlife Service or Natural Resource Conservation Service and their big wetlands and those sorts of things, I also get to deal with them. So basically, I go all over Iowa. <laughs> I go Missouri to Mississippi and so forth. But, but today here, so I did, a, I did a variation of this talk. I did this, uh, a similar talk a couple years ago. And Dr. Randall, Jesse Randall said, we got so many comments on that that he asked me to do it again, but I updated it a little bit. So we've, we've made it more current and stuff like that. But, but it really does, it's, it gets to a lot of what, what I do. And it, unfortunately, I don't get to do as much stuff as I used to with working like with you guys, like one-on-one -on -one and working in the field with you on your land and your plan and stuff like that. Um, because I just get dragged into more policy and different stuff that the government does. Um, but this is really about you guys and what, what, what we can get opportunities out there for you, how you think about your land, and then especially I want to get in some cost share stuff because there's things out there that most people just don't know about that we'd love to be able to get those resources to you. Because as broke as the government is, we have a lot of stuff for private landowners that we never spend um, and so forth. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about creating ha habitats on your land and your ethic and the kind of way you're going. And, and the truth of the matter is, no, don't mind because I want I'm kind of a big dumb animal, you know, kind of a big beast, and I just kind of roam the prairie a little bit. It's kind of my thing. Um, and you can't see the green on this map, of course, very well. But it, and this is going to be kind of Iowa. I'm going to try and enroll some Wisconsin, Illinois, and stuff into it too here. But, uh, but this map of Iowa, and you can't really see the green very well. But we don't, there's very little in terms of what the public actually owns. And so most of our habitat conservation has got to be from you folks. It's got to be private lands, right? Most of the stuff we do and the conservation we're going to get out there is going to happen on private lands. And if we look at a land cover map of Iowa, we see that, oy, there's a lot of brown out there, and that brown is corn and soybeans, right? And of course, and I don't, the pointer doesn't work on this thing. Um, but up here in this driftless area in that, that northeast Iowa, and then again, we call it the southern triangle, basically from the, excuse me, the two southern corners up to Des Moines and back, there's actually a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of ground out there. And so, you know, we get this reputation of a flyover state that's just corn, bean, and pigs. There's a lot of diversity to Iowa's landscape out there, okay? If we look at Iowa, about 24 and a half million of our acres are harvested row crops. So about 70% of the state is, is row crop. About 5% is impermeable surfaces. Less than 2% is public ownership, okay? Um, but if you do the math, 20 to 25% of the state that's in private ownership has the potential to provide some sort of cool habitat. Woodlands, pastures, grasslands, CRP, you know, back corners, odd areas and stuff that you all own, okay? If we go over to Illinois, it's a similar story, but Illinois has got a little bit more diversity than Iowa does because we got the, you know, we got the, um, the Shawnee down in southern Illinois and stuff like that, the Illinois River Valley, um, and then up here in this area around Galena, the, the Driftless area again. So, but a, very, a similar story to Iowa and stuff like that. And then, and then we go to Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a different matter, different matter yet, okay? A lot of agriculture, yes. North of the Wisconsin River, we hit a, uh, but we start to hit more timber and more forest. And of course, northern Wisconsin has got a lot more stuff. But, but regardless of land cover and stuff like that, the ethic you guys have, what are we doing out on our landscape to kind of to kind of get habitats and opportunities out there is kind of the point here today. So, so there are probably as many goals in here for landscape as there are people, right? As many landowners that are in here. Um, knowing where to start can be a big deal. Uh, about half my questions that I just came out, I just did a, a talk on some prescribed fire stuff downstairs. About half those questions were like, where do we start? You know, and I, it was kind of, it kind of caught me off guard because I, I figured most of those landowners have seen me a couple times now and stuff like that. But, but where do we start? And sometimes knowing where to get that start and where to go to and who to talk to can be the biggest hurdle. Okay. I work with landowners all the time who bite off way more than they can chew. Right. I have a doctor down in central Iowa and he bought a 160. It's got 120 acres of timber on it. He was going to clean that timber up in three months. That was his winter project. He was bound and determined by God. He got his steel 460 and he bought all that. And he and his boy were going to go out and they're going to get that timber cleaned up. And I said, 120 acres? I was like, how about we start with three? And then next year we'll do two or three more. And then after that, two or three more. But by God, he was gung ho. Okay. And it's like, sometimes we just don't know. And it, you know, we had some really nice red oak and some stuff like that in there. But then your, and your classic Iowa timber had a lot of junk in it. He was just bound and determined. He was going to chainsaw that whole 120 that way. Oy. So many, landowners go ahead and they tackle those projects on their own, right? I, I think all of you have done something that you didn't know you could get paid for, 
right here in this in this audience, okay? You tackle projects on your own because you want to do it, right? It's your land, you want to go out there and you want to see it done and get the project done and stuff like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about knowing who to talk to to start with. But if we think about there, what are some different goals? We have landowners, farmers, tenants, operators, the public, county supervisors, all these entities out there with kind of interest in private lands and stuff like that. What are some of your goals out there? What is, what's the goal for your land? Put you on the spot. Less invasive. less invasive species. How about you guys? Good place for your grandchildren. Absolutely. Over here. Clean it up for the future. You bet. So we have lots of this stuff. And I bet most of these, you probably hit a lot of this stuff, right? Forest regeneration. Maybe you want more oak. Okay, income source. Maybe it's got a generator revenue stream. Maybe you need that. Okay, maybe that's part of your income and stuff like that. Aesthetics, home ownership, passing it on, habitat, soil and health or soil and water quality, recreation. So we have all these different all these different ideas out there. We have all these different levels of engagement out there. Some of us are very engaged, right? Some of us just acquired the property and it's like, oh my gosh, where do I start? Okay, and you just feel like you're just taking that axe and you're just going out in the woods to just start hacking. Okay, so we have all sorts of different ideas and different levels of engagement. Okay, cultural knowledge. So by cultural knowledge, here's what I mean, okay? When you're out there and so forth and you're talking to your neighbor and your neighbor says, boy, the Lyme disease is really bad. The ticks are all over this year, right? Well, or you might go out there and you might prescribe fire all the time. Geez, you can't burn. If you burn down, you're gonna burn the county down, okay? So these cultural knowledge, these tidbits that we go out and we get, okay? In general, in general, it's great. In general, they're just fine because we're going out there and we're seeking information, right? Um, sometimes we don't get the right information, and I get all sorts of stuff. I work for the Iowa DNR, which means that about three or four times a month I'm asked about why we're releasing mountain lions. Um, and God dang it, take all the bears back to Wisconsin. I got that once. I got that once. I got the finger in my chest. He's like, I don't want you to kill them. I just want you to go catch them all and take them back to Wisconsin. And it's like, oh, there ain't that many of us to go roam the woods looking for bears. You know, so you get these, you get these pieces of knowledge that are out there, and they're not wrong, okay? But sometimes they're a little bit misguided, okay? You know, we're not often equipped with that background and stuff to kind of really make the impact on your land that you might want, okay? And so we might start down a path and you might do a project and you might start cutting trees and after a month or two, you're like, well, I guess I didn't really want to cut all those trees, but now you've done it. Now you're down that path and then you kind of switch direction. So the purpose of having a plan is very important, you know, kind of a direction that you're going to go for a couple of years of where we're going to get this project done. Stuff doesn't happen overnight. Stuff that I like to hear, you know? We put out 500 pheasants and incubators every year to help the population out, okay? All you did was make lots of fox snacks, okay? <laughs> They're beautiful. It's, it's cultural knowledge. Well, if we put pheasants out there, we'll have stuff to hunt. Well, you might shoot three or four of those, and the rest of them are fox snacks, and we'll die that first winter. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's out there. That's, that's the fact. I mean, so lots of people think that's helpful, but it might not be. Turkeys eat all the quail chicks. My nephew's friend's cousin's dad shot a turkey that had eaten a whole bunch in the stomach that one time to time right these are fun stuff that we get you know oh my gosh we we're out we we're doing a fire a year and a half ago we we're right on the minnesota border and this car came screaming across from minnesota my god quit burning the prairie you're killing all the ducks and it's like oh well we burned 60 acres we might have gotten two duck nests the duck will re-nest you know but they're adamant that we had to stop now and they're going to turn us in for killing all the ducks and it's like well you know sometimes you have to take you have a little bit of a yeah, you sacrifice a couple things for the greater good so that we keep the trees and the, and the invasive species and those things out of there so that the grass maintains and we grow more ducks. Um, yeah, we usually try and shoot several hawks every year to keep them from picking off all the pheasants. Well, that's a federal offense, you know, so <laughs> I got that, got that at the state fair. My, my, my next door neighbor in college told me that all the time. Yeah, he was, he was Southern Iowa, so we'll give him that. But um, yeah, we, we shoot 20 or 30 red tails every year just to keep the pheasants up. And it's like, that, that has zero impact on pheasant populations whatsoever. So um, why would you want to get rid of cedar trees? And I admitted in the last talk I'm an anti-cedite, right? I'm an anti-cedar tree guy. Um, why would you want to get rid of all the cedar trees? I was only native evergreen. Why would you do that, right? And probably a lot of you, and a lot of you in this room would ask me the same question. Okay, well, I'm a wildlife guy. I'd never say 500 skunks per acre is a good thing. No, I wouldn't say 500 cedars per acre is a good thing. So in its right place, they're appropriate. But they're but there are these things that are out there, and so generally we have this 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 um kind of this 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 what am I looking for here? This this ethic or so forth. That, yeah, we want we want trees. We want to reforest some of these areas. We want nice habitat. 
Okay, but then we go down this road where, oh, cedar trees. Well, so, you know, they can be misguided. Okay, so where to start going for help? And this is going to be a hard map to see and stuff like that. But myself, I'm up on the map in the middle. Um, but when you start going down this road, we actually, Iowa DNR, I'm going to show you some Wisconsin contacts and some Illinois contacts too, I think. We've got that in this program. Um, and stuff like that. But up here in Northeast Iowa, you go to Greg Schmidt. He's our wildlife biologist in Northeast Iowa. And he can hook you up with the resources. Or if you're right along the river counties here, um, you can go see Brian Sauer. Okay, those are people with Iowa DNR who can put you down to get you the tools and get you into equip contracts and those sorts of things. We'll talk about all of this. Um, to go ahead and start getting that plan developed for you. So when you start trying to make a woodland plan, maybe they'll hook you up with the forester so you can develop a managed timber harvest plan or something like that. Okay, those resources that you may not know are out there. So um, Pheasants Forever has a lot of farm bill biologists. Um, Northeast Iowa's got Allie Rath up here. Chris Heyer is in the Dubuque area and stuff like that. Those folks can also, they fulfill a very similar function. They're out there to help you, connect you with programs and stuff like that to get you set up. Wisconsin, Darcy Kind is their LIP coordinator, the Landowner Incentive Coordinator and their Program Coordinator up there. She can kind of point you in the right way and hook you up with the different foresters that Wisconsin has um, and to try and uh, to try and get you assistance there in your woodlands and stuff like that. I should take a step back. I did not put DNR's foresters up here because our map is, we're in about iteration four in the last two months of what our map looks like with some foresters um, and stuff like that. But just on Thursday, our Natural Resource Commission actually approved that we're going to hire four more probably four more contract foresters for Northeast Iowa. So we're gonna be able to get more help out here because there's a lot of Eastern Iowa, Northeast Iowa woodland owners and stuff like that that really wanna get out and get good stuff done in their woodlands. Illinois, their wildlife bureau and so forth. Their biologists will come out and help you if you're over in Northeast Illinois. Um, a nice interactive map, you can find this online and go click on that and so forth to get your contacts over there. Um, we get through this agency stuff a little bit more quickly here. Um, but NRCS, if you want to go in and you want NRCS and the USDA programs, you can click on your county and it'll bring you bring up your local service center, what town and your contact and your district conservationist of who to go talk to. You know, this one happens to be Bob Moser. He's over at Webster City and stuff like that. He'll give you his phone number and so forth. Similar resources exist for both Wisconsin and Illinois. Go talk to those folks. Okay, go talk to those folks. All right. And so, you know, the point of us being out here and why the private land staff and and so forth are out here is that so when we work with you, you know, we get your goals, your concerns, and we try and develop a plan of action so you're not just going so willy nilly down the road. Okay. Um, you know, we try and develop some goals, get that plan developed and so forth. Then we try and match you up with the tool. So we're gonna figure out what you want to do. And then how do we get you there? If that's equip, if that's state money, if that's some private resources that we can tap into, or a contractor and stuff like that. Okay. And I'm going to tell you right now, the programs, the tools can be overwhelming in and of themselves. I mean, it is, it would be virtually impossible for all of you to try and keep track of everything that comes out from the government and everything that's, that's out there to try and get stuff done. Um, and so continuing to work with that professional is kind of important, especially like on an equip contract. We'll do three year equip contract cycles and we'll, I'll have one landowner that will go three years and they'll get it done in two. So we'll do something else. So we'll go three years and they'll get it done in two and so forth. So we can kind of roll those things together. Okay. So real quickly, before we dive into a little bit of stuff, an update on the 2018 Farm Bill, and some of you are probably wondering, because some any CRP landowners in here? CRP landowners or stuff like that? Okay, bunch, a lot of CRP landowners. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> um, it's an election year. Um, the Farm Bill has expired, or it will expire, excuse me, on September 30th. But basically, we are in the last program year of the current Farm Bill. It will expire on September 30th, and we're probably not, we're not going to get a new one. I mean, it's an election year and so forth. Um, there's really not a lot of mo movement in Congress right now to try and get an or try and get a farm bill put together. Um, and so right now what we're he hearing is that some CRP re-enrollments may be allowed as acres expire with the end of the 2018 um, um, crop year and so forth, but nothing is for certain. We may not get new acres back. We don't know. We are at the caps and so forth. Um, Congress has indicated some willingness to expand from our 24 million acre cap. And where I'm at, a lot of, a lot of folks are interested in trying to get back into CRP, but, but Congress ratcheted the caps way down to 24 million acres. Um, they've shown some willingness to expand, but right now what we are hearing is that they don't want the program to cost more. Um, and so they may say, yeah, we're at 24 million acres, we'll go to 30 million acres on the cap, but it can't cost any more than it does now. And so some of the ideas that are being floated around is that they only pay you 80% of the rental rate instead of the full 100%. 
or that they give you the 100% of the rental rate, but they don't pay any cost share for practices on the backside. And so some of the states are being asked to submit comments and stuff like that of what we would like to see. You know, I would rather see cost share on the backside to help landowners out. I mean, if those are our options and stuff like that, I would probably see some, like to see um, um, the cost share on the backside. Um, you know, basically what we're probably going to run into is that we're going to run into a um, kind of a continuing resolution omnibus bill. And so basically they just say, whatever you did last year, do it again next year. And that's kind of the way these farm bill things work. Um, so we'll probably see EQIP, ASAP, CSP, and all those things kind of continue on at their current levels, um, which unfortunately in fiscal year 18 were ratcheted, they're all cut in half. So the farm bill, the way it was structured the last time, levels went up for four years, and then the last year of the, of the farm bill, they cut them in half. And that's probably what we'll see for 2019 is that half number again. So, all right. So CRP is out there. It's administered by Farm Service Agency. The technical responsibility is NRCS. The enrollment caps are set by Congress. And so, believe me, I get none, none of you guys. You guys in the room are all awesome. But I get lots of people come at me and just gripe at me and just yell at me about, God dang it, well, I have to get this farm back into CRP and make it work. And it's like, that's Congress. <laughs> You know, me out there in the landscape, I can't do much. You know, I can I can help you design it, I can help you get a plan, I can get you the NRCS and hooked up. But once we're at the cap, Congress limits that. And there's no way to change that those caps without talking to Congress. Um, there's nothing anybody in Iowa or Wisconsin or uh, Illinois can do. Our cap is 24 million acres. It's been as high as 37 million, right? And basically we have these two broad divisions, um, continuous and general sign-up. General sign-up, we haven't had an opening in a while. It's been about a year and a half since we had our last general sign-up CRP. Um, you know, that's basically more erosion, soil erosion, water quality, and stuff like that with whole field enrollments. Um, you know, their, their bid ranking and score, and typically that's where you go and you bid. That's where you tell them what you want to take. Um, their 10-year contracts, and you know, they're usually capped at about $240 an acre. As opposed to continuous, um, which there's a whole number of practices, you can roll in any time. They're open all the time, except for right now we are at the cap. So pretty much everything is, is closed, except for some very specific programs like quail buffers in southeast Iowa that still have some acres left in them that they can just, they can kind of squeeze things in here and now, okay? Um, you know, those practices are much more targeted at very specific resource concerns, um, and they're basically automatic acceptance. Now, a big deal uh, with CRP and stuff like that is the western states got really mad at the Midwest. Um, you know, so in Iowa, we had to go to a $300 an acre rental cap. Some people, I saw one CRP contract that went for four oh six twenty five an acre. Um, which is impressive, is in Guthrie County. Um, but basically, the western states get all the acres, but Iowa gets all the money. Um, you know, so the western states may get tons of acres in, but they pay $27 an acre cash rent on your CRP rent. Whereas Iowa is getting $350, $360 an acre for some of our rental practices. And so the western state senators are starting to get pretty perturbed that, you know, we didn't have any acres, but we had all the money. And all the western states got all the acres, but no money. And so they've kind of, that's one of the things they're looking at adjusting again, too, coming forward here. So most of these are 10 and 15 year contracts. Most of them have 90% cost share and some signing. What's really, really popular, and landowners really took this and ran with it, is the CP42 pollinator habitat, right? And part of that was driven by there wasn't a lot of other programs open and stuff like that. But part of it was driven by general interest and stuff like that. Um, but we have about 450,000 acres of, of pollinator habitat that was allowed in the program nationwide. And Iowa has just shy of 200,000 of that. So Iowa took the lion's share of that, of that enrollment and stuff like that. Um, you know, so 50% of the entire program nationwide ended up in Iowa and about another 26% in Illinois. So basically two states took it all um, and stuff like that. So, all right. The one I really want to hit here is EQIP. Okay. And EQIP may be the biggest unknown to all of you that's out there. Okay. Um, if you can think it, EQIP will pay for it. I mean, it's a matter of speaking NRCS speak, and that's why it's really helpful to work with someone like myself or Greg Schmidt or Brian Sauer or somebody from um, your colleagues from the other states and stuff like that. Um, but if you can think that you want to do it on your land, EQIP will probably pay for it. Okay? Huh, it's probably the least known of the Farm Bill program, certainly for wildlife and forestry and stuff like that. Okay? And it's administered by NRCS. You just apply with what's called a CPA 1200. I do not have my calendar, but write this down. The batch date is March 15th, I think. It's next week Friday, whatever next week Friday is, okay? And for, uh, for Iowa, for Iowa, I don't know what Wisconsin, Illinois, are. the Iowa batch date for the second consideration 
is is next week Friday, whatever that date is. What is today? It's, I think it's the 16th, isn't it? Okay. Yep. And so basically what that means is you just have to sign an application. You don't have to do anything beyond sign an application, but that application has to be received in the field office by next week Friday in order to be considered. Okay. And so in Iowa, in Iowa, and I don't know what the other states do, but basically the law says, the law that enables EQIP says that 5% of all funds have to go to wildlife, small landowners, and foresters, okay? And everything else can go to all the other ag practices and water quality and stuff like that it wants to. But in Iowa, that means we get over a million dollars strictly for wildlife and, and those sorts of things every single year. And we're lucky if we spend 600000 of it. So there's a lot of money that's still available out there. EQIP does not pay annual rent, okay? But rather, it's a flat rate reimbursement program for specific practices, okay? And so if you're not so concerned about, boy, this, this needs to generate income for me, I need CRP rental off it. But boy, it's, it's kind of expensive, or I'd really like to clean up those woods, or I'd really like to get a prescribed burn done, or I'd really like to try goat grazing to take care of my invasives. Anything you can think of can be paid for under Equip Wildlife, okay? And you'll get some cost share for it, okay? <sighs> Oh boy, that doesn't show up at all. <laughs> Look at that weird color text. Okay. Basically, it's a flat rate reimbursement program. Okay. The way EQIP works is a flat rate reimbursement program. And so if you go out there and you're like, you know what, I want to string, I want to string what, 500 foot of goat fence so I can graze some goats in here and take care of the multiflora rows a little bit. And that, and that fence is $2, a, you, can, you can put that fence in for $1.50 a foot. Okay, so you can put that in for $1.50 a foot. The equip rate may be $1.70 a foot on that equip rate. Okay, you're going to get $1.70 a foot, period. So if it costs you $1.50, you're going to get $1.70. If it costs you $2, you're going to get $1.70. Okay, same thing with prescribed fire. Same thing with any practice they have. It's a flat rate reimbursement. So if that practice is $100 an acre, okay, if, or if the cost share is $100 an acre and you can do it for $75, you're going to get $100 an acre to do it. Okay. Um, when you start to get into bigger projects, I'll show you an example here in a minute. This can work in your favor. Um, these things can work in your favor. Um, all wildlife practices are now considered high use and not specialty landowner, but whatever. So they pay a specialty rate. So in general, in general, EQIP is supposed to pay 50% of any practice you do. But all wildlife, small forestry, small landowner practices are all supposed to be cost shared at 75%. So they've given them the high use rate or the specialty landowner rates on those things. And then even at that point, there's a lot of stuff I can get done for as much money as they, they'll put into it. Okay. And EQIP can help with the planning, not just the projects themselves. So those of you who are downstairs in my prescribed burn thing a little bit ago, right? You're like, okay, I feel confident that I can not burn the county down on my own. But boy, I just don't know what kind of conditions I should look for or what kind of you know, I've got 10 people to help me, but I don't know what kind of plan I should have. All right. If you have a 2100, or if you have a 21 acre woodland, Equip will pay you $575 just to go have a plan written, right? To go out and get a forester to write you a plan. Okay. And that's just the planning phase. It'll then pay you, depending on how, if you're under 100 acres, it'll pay you $70 an acre to burn your woods. And if you're over 100 acres, it'll pay you $100.31 an acre to burn your woods. Um, you know, so those rates are out there and they're pretty darn good. You know, so if you got a hundred acre wood at a hundred dollars an acre, you can very quickly get to, do the math, 10,000? I think. <laughs> trying to do the math in my head there quick, okay? You can very quickly get to a $10,000 equip payment, okay? You know, that's to assist you with hiring the consultants to do it. You know, like me, myself, there's, after my colleague Kathy retired last week, there's four of me in Iowa, you know, and then I've got some people who work for me and stuff like that, some technicians who are out there a little bit more local than I am. But basically, I mean, if you can't get a hold of me, you can certainly get equip money to help you get a, for, a, con, a consulting forester, to get a different sort of land contractor and stuff like that, who will help you write the plan and carry that, that, those practices out, okay? There are state, state and regional level specific initiatives. So if we don't fit you into wildlife, into the, into the wildlife sub-account, we might get you into the Northeast Iowa, um, Northeast Iowa Trout Streams account, okay? So there's all sorts of different little specific regional practices that are very county by county that I might not know about because I don't live in Northeast Iowa. Um, but that might be if you go into that El Cater office or something like that, they can hook you up with, right? Um, RCPPs, it's a different thing. Um, there's quail focus projects out of RCPP, which is the Regional Conservation Priorities Program, which is another part of EQIP. If you work for the government, you live in acronym land. Um, it's just what it is. So there's tons of money 
if you're not so concerned about generating a, C, a CRP rental payments, but you really want to do wildflowers on your land, there's tons of money in the Monarch Initiative with Equip. And so they will, I mean, six or seven hundred dollars an acre for seed and stuff like that, plus land preparation, plus mowing. You can get mowing payments on that. So when you go out and mow it, you're paying yourself eighteen dollars an acre to go out and mow the seeding after that. So these things are all built in there, and there's a lot of money there for it. Okay. Here's an example. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is an example pro equip project that we did. Um, and this is for a private landowner that we did and stuff like that. Um, and they eventually, and there's there's some different goals behind this based on our long-term strategy for this property. This is a 170-acre property, right? We restored 11, 11.4 acres of oxbows. We cleaned up, I'll say, 27 acres of woods that had oaks and stuff in it. It was all overgrown with honeysuckle and and um, uh, honey locust, gliditzia, and just all sorts of junk trees and stuff like that. And this spring, this picture was just taken here, oh, just before Christmas, so you can't really see it, but that's our, our big oxbow channel that we've cleaned out. We hauled out 220 truckloads of dirt, I think, 220 semi-loads or something like that. Um, we got $170,000 in equip for it, right? We got $170,000 for that landowner in that equip contract. And I think the project ended up costing him about 160. So in the end, he ended up 10,000 ahead on it. Okay, so then he's going to plow that money back into his property and stuff like that. But you know, the practices here. So if you have, depending on what you have, maybe you have an old oxbow in a pasture that you're interested in restoring. In Iowa, we will pay you $19,120 an acre to restore that oxbow. You move a lot of dirt for $19,000 an acre um, and stuff like that. So the rates tend to be very, very, very good. So I would truly encourage you, if you're going to go out and do something, I mean, the TSI rates can be all over the place. The brush management rates, if you're going to go out and you're going to try and take the bush honeysuckle or the multiflora or the cedar or whatever it is in your woodland out, um, we can get $135 an acre plus to do that. So you can go in there and if you want to like rent a, a, you know, a forestry mower or a macerator to get in and kind of chew that stuff up, $135 to $170 an acre to get that. So if you can go in and you can burn that on your own, there's no reason that you can go out and burn your own 100-acre wood for $100 an acre, right? You write an equip contract, you do it yourself, you pay yourself to do it, okay? Don't just go burn it on your own. You get paid for it. You're going to take a Saturday to do it. So, all right. So that's equip. So we'll move on to the WRP program. This is a little bit bigger thing. And there's a lot of stuff along the Wisconsin River. There's a lot of easements going up and down the Wisconsin River. So we're going to jump from equip, which is a cost share program. So we went from CRP, which is a rental rate program to equip, which is a cost share program. Now we're going to go over to the, e the federal easement program, right? <clears throat> so the easement program is when you have lands that qualify. In, in Iowa, we have to have 50% hydric soils on those lands. But if you have lands that you're, you, you're just out there because you like to hunt, or you just have land that's river bottom and it's not very productive and you're more interested in kind of putting that away, we do have the WRE program, and there's a bunch of different variants of it but it's perhaps the most successful farm bill conservation program in terms of what we get for lasting conservation measures on the landscape, right? And basically, in Iowa, you're gonna get what's called a GARC, which is the Geographic Area Rate Cap, but right now that average is about $5,700 an acre is the easement payment. And once you've, once you've gotten that payment, you then cede the rights to farm that land over to the U.S. government. You still own it, fee title, you own the deed, but you basically said, I'm not gonna farm this anymore forever, and so the government will give you $5,700 an acre for it. Um, right now, um, and then all costs, all restoration costs, if you're restoring oxbows, if we're going back in, we do stuff where we do oxbows and we put oak restorations or oak seedings next to them, kind of down on river bottom hardwoods, you know, swamp whites and stuff like that. Um, all those things, all those costs are 100% paid for on that easement. So you incur no cost. Your legal fees and anything that you do to record that easement are all 100% paid for, okay? It is pretty competitive. Um, we're actually over 180,000 acres in Iowa now. Um, we have 1,700 and, I want to say 1,762 easements or something like that in Iowa now. So, um, those, the, I mentioned those congressional caps, how those funds are going to be cut earlier. Um, you know, we're at 450 million, 16, 500 million, 17, and this year we're, we've been cut in half down to 250 million. Okay. Um, you know, Iowa gets anywhere from eight to 10 easements a year, and it takes about two years to get an easement filed. So if you start going down that road, if you come talk to me today, I file a CPA 1200 and we start going down that road for you, it'll take about two years for that whole process to complete for you to get a check in the end. In the meantime, you have full agricultural rights to that land. Okay? And if, you, if the government cannot close an easement by August 31st, then you get agricultural rights to it for the next year. So the government has to wait a year. So you may have your check for the land, but you still get a farm at another year. Um, the states are allowed a lot of leeway 
in these things. So Wisconsin is very different from Iowa. Iowa is very different from Illinois. So we're a lot, a lot of leeway in how we develop the program, okay? As well as state by state deadlines for our individual rankings. We rank them once a year, and we rank them a fiscal year ahead. So even though that we are coming up on April 26th, we are fiscal 19 consideration will start on April 26th this year. So you have to have your application filed by April 26th of this year. So usually we get anywhere from eight to 10 to 11 million, which gives us about eight or 10 easements a year because there's a lot of other costs to figure on the backside of some of that stuff. Um, but Iowa, is it Iowa and Illinois or Iowa and Wisconsin? Iowa and Illinois are very, very good. Lots of states don't spend this at all and they just give it back to Washington, D.C. And when they give it back to Washington, D.C., D.C. then kind of opens up the rest of the states. Well, so Arkansas didn't want their money. Anybody else want it? Iowa and, I think it's Iowa and Illinois are very, very good at grabbing other states' money. And so we'll get right to the end and we'll say, well, these 10 people are going to get in this year. And then they'll, they'll put out some call and we're like, oh, we snagged another $1.5 million so four more people get in. And so we're pretty good about that. So if we get on that, our list in Iowa right now, any given time, our list is about 125 people on the list. And we usually can take about eight or nine a year. But it's, that list is re-ranked and reshuffled every year. So it goes all back into the hat. We rank everybody, and then the next year it comes out. So if that, you know, if five more people applied this year that weren't in there last year, they go into the hat. We shuffle the whole ranking again, and it comes back out. So you could end up at the top even if you haven't been there for a while. Okay? All right. Partners for Fish and Wildlife. And we're going to switch over those other three. So the easements, the equip, and I didn't talk about CSP. Anybody, anybody in here mess with CSP? We've got one guy in the back. And... How is it for you? It's okay. Okay. That doesn't surprise me. I have one guy in the back. CSP is not a terribly popular program. It's harder for wildlife and forestry and small landowners to do much with. Um, and sometimes people don't look into it. So I didn't touch on it all. But the conservation stewardship program is another thing where you can make tweaks to your operation or tweaks to the practices that you do, and you get paid little incentives for things. And so it's it's not a rental rate, and it's not really a, a, a thing like cost share, like equip might be. It's more of incentivizing little things that you do kind of on your farm and on your land and stuff like that. It's, it's not used much in, in our context, in our kind of small landowner context. It's more of a production egg sort of sort of program. Um, but anyways, it's just worth mentioning that that's out there. So the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program is perhaps the most flexible thing we have outside of equip, and I can make equip work for almost anybody. Right, but Partners for Fish and Wildlife is actually run by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so not the not the uh, the Department of Agriculture, but by Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, in Iowa we prioritize oak savannas, potholes, and wetlands. Okay, um, but regionally we're putting tons of money into monarchs with this with this sort of thing. Um, I can get you, I could probably tomorrow or Monday, whatever tomorrow Sunday, I can get you four thousand dollars in seed on Monday, basically through this program. If you wanted to go out and seed your, you know, get some monarch seeding or get get a high diversity prairie reseeded and stuff like that. We don't pay any rent, and I'll help you do it, but I can buy you the seed, you know, sort of thing. So you'll still have to prep the soil and drill it and mow it, but I can get you the seed for those sorts of things. We're putting a lot of money into that from Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay? Most practices, if you wanted to do something, I mean, I've had landowners where we put in rock crossings or, or um, controlled water points for their cattle. Maybe they had a stream reach, that, or a stream reach excuse me, that had like, excuse me, Topeka Shiner or something in it, where we put a very controlled water point in there and Fish and Wildlife Service paid for it. So we could water the cattle, but they're not in the stream and we're keeping them out of the Topeka Shiner stream and stuff like that. We can do just about anything except fire. The Fish and Wildlife Service is super picky and they will not pay for anything with fire. It's just, it's a policy thing with lawsuits and stuff. But there are no set rates. They just basically want to see that you as the landowner are going to do something to help them. So if you're like, you know what? If you go out and you seed my prairie for me, if you go out and pay for the spraying and buy me the seed, well then I as a landowner agree to mow it for two years and get it established, that's your contribution and Fish and Wildlife Service will pay for the rest. And they'll ask you to sign a simple contract that says I agree to do these things and then Fish and Wildlife Service will pay for all this. So we're really good and we try and use those things like this. I mentioned earlier, um, in my earlier talk, I actually mentioned the uh, prescribed burning cooperatives. Fish and Wildlife Service likes to try and jumpstart some of those things with this stuff. Um, we like to use like local community groups to try and build capacity and get landowners and neighbors working together a little bit more uh, and stuff like that. Um, the problem is, is their funds are very, very limited. And Congress keeps whacking back at what this, what, what Fish and Wildlife gets for their partners' money. Um, because, I mean, this is money we go, we go straight to landowners and straight to, to property owners and owners and farmers yet, but it still just, it just keeps getting whacked by Congress. So it's harder to use, but it's certainly worth looking into. Okay. 
Some additional programs, um, that Monarch initiative I mentioned between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DNR um, and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of built off that same sort of thing that we'll put into $7,500. I'll buy you $7,500, up to $7,500 in seed, basically for any project that's out there. Um, and if you ever get looking at some of these seed mixes, they are expensive. You know, they're, they're spendy. They're $400 an acre and some of this stuff. So basically, we'll put in 20 acres of seed for you if, you, if you're willing. So um, Prairie Partners, and this is an Iowa thing. This is specifically an Iowa thing. And I have so much money in Prairie Partners. Four or five hundred thousand dollars right now in our Prairie Partners account, and so basically anywhere you want to go, I can pay for half your seat. And it's actually my discretion if you're going to do something educational or you're going to do something a little bit fancier. I can pay for more of it, right? And so basically we'll prov provide fifty percent of the cost of seed for those grasslands and savannas and stuff like that. And it doesn't have to be a full fancy mix. Mix if you just want to go three or four grasses. You know if it's better than what's there now. If you're brome grass and you want to convert and you want to go to like a big three grasses for pheasant hunting or something like that, I can get you the seed for that, or I can help buy that seed, okay? Boy, these colors are not showing up. Reap is the next one right there. My goodness. Okay, note to self, don't use reds and browns um, <laughs> right there. Reap is the next one, which we use for a lot of tree planting practices. There's a lot of cost here available for you guys um, who might be interested in doing more tree planting and stuff like that. Your foresters can work with you on that. Um, and then this last one here that you cannot read at all actually says state wild grants. And the state wildlife grants are, are grants that are made by the Fish and Wildlife Service to the state to work with private landowners on very specific projects. And so here in Northeast Iowa, like we have, we had, we don't have any more, we had money for rough grouse habitat. So we'd come in and we'd clear your aspen stand to try and get your aspen habitat regenerated, right? Because we want uneven staged, uneven aged stands of aspen for different, different kinds of rough grouse habitat on your property. We would pay 100% of the cost to come in and do the forestry work. And we literally couldn't get a landowner through the door. I mean, we we're, we were knocking on doors to try and give the money away. It's like, you want $10,000? Because we can't get rid of it. Um, up here in Northeast Iowa, there's goat prairie money. Um, there's rattlesnake money. A little bit further west, um, not, not, it's still Northeast Iowa, but more like Bramer County and stuff like that. We actually have wood turtle money. That if you're in a river bottom and stuff like that, we will pay to clean up your timber and try and redevelop wood turtle habitat. So we have lots of smaller, specific pots of money that we can also try and get people hooked up with, especially if you've got different kinds of weird species or depending on where you are in the state. Okay. And then, at least in Iowa, I think the other two states have them as well, but there are property tax initiatives out there as well. Um, these are harder to get to, and, and right now the legislature is making it a little bit harder for us to use these things. But if you're willing to take your land out of production, stuff like that, there are also property tax initiatives where we can help you out um, where we could offset property taxes, we can have them reduced. So, all right. Let's see. What time is lunch? One? Is lunch at one? All right. Some of this stuff I'm going to go through a little bit uh, faster. The landowner incentive program over in Wisconsin DNR, um, you know, it works. It's very similar to what we do. They work spe really specifically in the driftless area. Um, and so your wildlife again, you could contact that Darcy Kind. She'll put you in contact with more local wildlife biologists to get out there. But they do a lot of habitat projects over here for SGCN, and that's an acronym, but Species of Greatest, greatest Conservation Need. So those are those things that aren't real common, they're not endangered, and so there's no regulation on them yet, but they're things that are like, you know, we, we don't want to see them blink out and stuff like that. So there's funds available and different sorts of projects for SGCNs over there. Um, you know, over on the Illinois side, the Illinois Acres for Wildlife, um, you know, they, I'm trying to see what that is, it's a little less familiar with that one than Wisconsin's. But basically, their, their tax incentives and stuff like that and cost share available for, for Illinois landowners is you go work with your Illinois wildlife biologists. Um, the VPAs are getting to be a big thing. In Iowa, the, the demand is ridiculous. Um, Wisconsin's right now has kind of, they've curtailed theirs, and so they're just kind of holding steady, and Illinois is still kind of going on. All three programs are a little bit different, but these are programs where we as the state um, we'll actually help you manage your land and stuff like that in exchange for public hunting. And we'll pay some of the costs and stuff involved with that. Okay, so these voluntary public access programs began in 2011 um, as grants awarded to the Farm Service Agency to Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. The new Farm Bill, one thing that has come out of the new Farm Bill, in the past, Congress put in $50 million for all 50 states. Iowa has been very successful in that Iowa got, we got $1 million and then we got $3 million. So we've had two of these grants in the last couple of years for voluntary public access, okay? One thing Congress wants to do, they funded that at 50 million the last couple farm bills, they want to put in 250 million in the new farm bill. They like the fact that we want to talk to landowners about doing stuff on your property 
in exchange for public recreation, you know, giving people a chance to get outdoors and stuff like that. Um, each state manages their program a little bit differently with different options. Um, in Iowa, we don't pay for access. So I'm not gonna, Iowa does not pay you to allow people to hunt on it. But if you have any other conservation program, we incentivize that. So if CRP pays 90% of your costs, we're gonna pick up the other 10% and we'll pay to mow it and we'll pay to get it burned. So we're not actually paying you because that just, it's a kind of a parliamentary trick because if we paid you to allow public hunting on it, then you would be liable if somebody got hurt on your land. If we don't pay you for hunting, but we pay you for conservation, then it falls outside of chapter 51 and you're completely protected from anybody getting injured. So, so it's a kind of a little thing, the way that we use our, our codes and stuff like that. Landowners allow public access for a, a period of years, we average. We, we'd hope that our landowners would give us three or four years. We average like almost like 9.8 years because our landowners like the program so much, okay? We are exhausted on our funds. We have just shy of 30,000 acres of public hunting, which are mostly private lands that we take care of for, for the private landowners. So we manage it, we burn it, we make sure that the, the habitat improvements, the tree plantings get done. We take care of all those other things that USDA or whoever might require, and we do it for you, okay? Okay, uh, I'll skip over a couple so we can get some questions. Um, let's see, da, 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 da. so Illinois' program, okay? Illinois targets their program a little bit more towards watersheds and very acceptable practices. And theirs is different because the landowner gets to pick what you do. In Iowa, if you enroll in our program, anything that is legal to hunt, you can hunt. Any legal weapon to hunt with, you can hunt with. You cannot fish, you cannot hike, you cannot bird watch, you cannot ride ATVs, you cannot canoe. In Iowa's program, you can only hunt, you can't trap. Okay, Illinois' program is a little different in that they allow, you pick which practices you want to allow on your land and so forth. If you want canoeing or pond fishing or whatever it is, they have three year leases that they then cover the liability through that. And then you get to pick the practices you want to do. So Illinois program is a little bit different. Wisconsin's is currently on hold right now. They're kind of right at, they've kind of hit a holding point um, that they have a program where they actually do the lease fee and their, their legal structure, Wisconsin's legal structure is different than Iowa's, right? Where the landowners are actually paid a fee by the state to allow um, people to go in and hunt and stuff like that, okay? Fishing, trapping, wildlife viewing are all allowed versus Iowa's hunting only. So, I don't have a picture there, do I? Oh, I do have a picture. Okay, so I think this afternoon, I mean, after lunch, Brian Fankhauser from the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation will talk in depth about this, and I hope some of you get to it, okay? But once you start to think about, you know, a couple of gentlemen over here mentioned grandchildren and kids and stuff like that, that we're passing this land on, we wanna see it protected, or we wanna see the practices that we put in place kind of perpetuate into the future. Um, a good thing to do is to talk to a land trust. And that's what Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, Foundation is. The Nature Conservancy can be. Um, Wisconsin has several, and Illinois has several even more localized. But basically, these are ways to protect your land going into the future, okay? Like I said, Brian Fankhauser from the Heritage Foundation will do an entire talk on this, uh, the details and specifics and stuff like that. Um, but these are ways to put an easement on your land, on the deed to your land, so that when it passes down to the next generation, there are certain things that can be done and cannot be done. You know, we can put restrictions and, e and fee title things and easement deed, easement restrictions on those sorts of things. Um, you know, Natural Heritage Foundation will hold easements basically that says this land cannot be used or this wetland has to be protected on our land forever. You can farm the rest of it, you can farm over here, but these 20 acres of wetlands are permanently protected. We can't drain them and stuff like that. That then stays with that easement forever so that your generations after you, or if you were to sell the property and stuff like that, that restriction stays on. So those things are out there. Um, it's much more of a permanent protection sort of option as you're passing land down and stuff like that or giving it to heirs. So as we tie this stuff back together, am I good? About good, good. So as we tie this stuff back together, right? We want to work, you know, our job out here is to work with, with folks like you guys, okay? Those people who are really truly advancing conservation on the landscape. Because what we own, what we own publicly will never protect species and they'll never take things into the future like they should. So that effort has to be on private lands. Okay, so we're here to work with you on developing your plan. Take time to plan. People, a lot of you all have done land improvement projects and stuff like that. Nothing is gonna get done by next year. I mean, it's, it's not a project that, okay, we're gonna do this this month, we're gonna do that next month or next year. No, these things are two, three, five, ten 10-year sorts of projects as we work. We kind of make a little bits and we make some increments and we maintain and then we take another chunk and we make increments and then we maintain, okay? Realize the effort required, don't go it alone. Okay, make sure you have financial backing. 
help, assistance. Make sure you have some cons consultants or some contractors. You have a plan going forward. Because otherwise, things just tend to be piecemeal, okay? We want kind of a comprehensive plan of how we're going to go, um, go down that road, okay? Consider new ideas to help you achieve your goals and pass things on, okay? That's a big deal now. It's getting to be a bigger deal here as we kind of hit generational turnovers and stuff like that. We see a lot of land sold to a lot of different kinds of people and stuff like that. You know, as ideas, we want to see them perpetuate. We want to see people's goals perpetuate and stuff like that, okay? And so with that, hey, I ended. Well, I actually have time for questions. I told you I can be asked. So anyways, so with that, um, that's all I have right now. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for letting me wander. So we can do some questions if we got time because, well, we're only limited by lunch. And I'm limited by lunch. So his question is, Illinois gets lots of money. Iowa gets lots of money. What's wrong with Wisconsin? It, it, every state, it, it comes down to how states and agencies are administered and, and, and set up. I don't know personally as much about Wisconsin as I like to say do Minnesota because my, you know, my, I got counterparts right across the road in Minnesota. Illinois is a little bit, a little bit better at pulling funds and stuff like that. It's just, it's kind of political wills and stuff like that. I mean, some of these funds at the state level that the states get, like we have to actually, and sometimes it's personnel. I mean, it, it may come down to like the, the woman in Des Moines who runs Iowa's easement program is active. And when she, when we run out of money and she hears there's more out there, she goes and she gets it. And it may just come down to a simple thing like that, that they just don't have that kind of personnel in Wisconsin. The agencies, one thing with like federal money and the way things flow into Iowa, Wisconsin has a, has a Wisconsin DNR is three times, four times the size of Iowa DNR, okay, as an agency. They don't necessarily go get very much money because they're like, we have what we need and we're not going to deal with anymore. Iowa, we're kind of broke, and so we're like, heck, we're going out and getting all we can, right? Minnesota has actually gotten to a state where they're actually turning federal funds back because they just passed their, the thing where they protect their waterways. I forget what their acronym is for the, the buffer program and stuff like that. They're generating so much revenue in Minnesota, they're turning funds back. We ask Minnesota for help sometimes. They're like, yeah, no because we're getting so much money we can't spend it. So they, so Iowa just kind of gets left out there. So we're Iowa in particular is very active about going out and trying to get more help for landowners and stuff like that. Whereas the other states just aren't necessarily in that boat. So good question. Yep. So her question is great. It's how do you know what programs Equip offers up? Because if you don't know what the list is, how are you supposed to know? If you want to, I could pull my laptop out. The fiscal 18 Equip book is 595 pages long about what you can do. Okay, and so you have to find, and this is where you have to understand NRCS speak, and I call it NRCS speak, right? NRCS speak is identifying resource concerns. You say, well, I know you got timber damage and stuff like that. You're like, my timber's damaged. Well, what's your resource concern? Well, if you can't articulate your resource concern, and you don't have someone like me who can kind of talk to them, her resource concern is that she needs TSI and timber regeneration to clean up old stuff and stuff like that. You identify the resource concerns, then you match the equip to the practice and stuff like that. And there are about 13 different forestry practices in that 595 page book that we would probably look for one of those that match what you need to do, including timber stand improvement and cleanup and brush management and those sorts of things. Equip, their big book has different scenarios and it says, well, this scenario should look like this. And people get really hung up that it has to look like that. Even the federal people themselves, they get really confused on it. Well, it doesn't look like that. Well, it doesn't have to. That just tells you what the, an example scenario is. And so it's kind of, it can be tough to navigate. And that's why I'd really encourage you to work with someone who kind of is in the system a little bit. Yeah. So like myself or my counterparts in Northeast Iowa or, or Wisconsin and stuff like that. So, and with Equip, one more thing, with Equip, sometimes you have to be very persistent when you go to NRCS because they very often, when NRCS deals with Equip, 90% of what they're getting is how do I put in a manure management structure? How do I put in a tile protection? How do I put in a water quality thing? And so they don't very often deal with the forestry, wildlife, water quality, small things like that. So they may not even know that some of the stuff is out there. And so that's why I'd recommend try and hook up with somebody like a consultant or, an, or a DNR agency person, or someone who really kind of knows how that works. And they can write you a plan, go to NRCS and say, this is what she needs. Put these practices. That's how I do it. I, when I write a plan, I say, I need 315, 472, 390 and 645. And I said, I need these scenarios within each of those practice codes and put them in there. And then they're just like, oh, okay. And they write it. So that's kind of how we do it. So, yep. How do you rank people? In Iowa specifically, and every state gets to rank differently. So if you're Wisconsin, it might be different. Iowa specifically, basically, we can't spend all our money. It is ranked. It is ranked. You're correct. 
And so you do get ranked in your process with EQIP. Um, in Iowa specifically, things are put on like endangered species, um, you know, what, there's different levels of resource concern, like, you know, a completely degraded prairie is worth more points than a kind of degraded prairie or a choked woodland. So you get different points and stuff like that. In Iowa, though, we never spend all our money, so the ranking is kind of moot because everybody just gets funded. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you actually apply, you're probably going to get funded in Iowa because we can't spend that whole summer count down. So good question. Good question. Reed. Yes. His question is a slide we couldn't read. <laughs> Some of my red backgrounds and stuff like that was REAP. What is REAP? REAP is Resource Enhancement and Protection, and that's an Iowa program. Okay, um, and that is so you can go and you can work with your district forester, and that'll provide funds to go out and do tree plantings and stuff like that. And so if you're interested in tree plantings or there's a couple other timber practices and stuff like that, you can. I, I think they do some brush cleanup, and you can certainly I think get prescribed fire money out of REAP and stuff like that. And that's actually funded via Iowa's license plate. So we have those, the chickadee, or the, the goldfinch plates and stuff like that. So that REAP fund is actually generated there. And then that's cost shared back out to landowners and stuff like that who want to do 